Welcome to the Infosys Science Foundation Lecture. I am honoured to introduce our speaker today, Professor Shafi Golwaza. Shafi is the Director of the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing and is a Professor at UC Berkeley, MIT and the Wiseman Institute. She holds a BS in Applied Mathematics from CMU and MS and PhD in Computer Science from UC Berkeley. For the theoretical computer scientists in the audience, especially cryptographers, Shafi needs no introduction. She is the co-inventor of probabilistic encryption, which is the gold standard for secure encryption today. The co-inventor of zero-knowledge proofs that is rapidly making its way from theory to impactful practice. Her contributions include elliptic curve primality tests, hardness of approximation, combinatorial property testing, and the list goes on. It is impossible to overstate how much impact Shafi has had in shaping the field of cryptography as we know it today. She's a recipient of the two Goodell Prizes, ACM Hopper Award, RSA Award in Mathematics, AC in Pilot Foundation Investigative Award, and Noriel UNESCO Women in Science Award. Shafi is a member of the NAS, NAE, AAAS, Russian and Israeli Academies of Science and London Royal Mathematical Society. She also holds honorary degrees from many universities. There are many people who are good researchers, excellent educators and visionary scientists, but Shafi is someone who encompasses all of these and a source of inspiration to many in the field. Shafi, we are thrilled to have you here. Over to you. Thank you very much. So can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and a very generous introduction. So what I'll speak about today is uh, the title of my talk is The Right to Deny. Uh, what do I mean by that? So first, we'll get to the right to deny in, in like a slide or two. But I want to point out that a lot of people are, and including myself, have been paying attention these days uh, to these qu questions that are in the realm of what's called safe machine learning. And when you say fi safe machine learning, you mean many things, but usually you mean one of these four things, which is privacy in uh, machine learning models which use data, so you want to maintain the privacy of the data, verification maybe of the machine learning model properties, robustness to unforeseen input distributions, or people know this under the name of adversarial machine learning, uh, fair, algorithmic fairness has become a very big topic, and there's a lot of research in this. But all of this research uh, essentially concedes that the concentration of power uh, is uh, in, in the hands of those who have the data, and you are hoping that they're going to utilize some of these methods, either that they will learn a method employing the privacy techniques that you have developed, that they will make sure their algorithms are robust to the extent possible, that they'll make sure the algorithms are fair, that, and so forth. So you've sort of, you're developing these methods and you're hoping that the people who are actually writing the machine learning code uh, are going to uh, use the methods you've developed, maybe uh, verification is a bit of an exception because you could verify maybe not being the one who developed the model, properties of the model, okay? And what this talk about essentially it says is, uh, okay, you've, if we're assuming uh, that these centers who have all the data and all the power are benevolent, that's a bit risky because maybe they're not, and, or maybe they're going to be taken over by someone who is not so benevolent and all this... Uh, concentration of power in one place has some risks to it. Um, so I guess there's a quote here. So living in a surveillance state will not be made much better if the cameras watching you aren't discriminating against you. So a lot of people talking about cameras are discriminating and it's an important issue. But the fact that there are cameras everywhere and they're recording everything you do all the time, that's maybe, you know, even a larger issue uh, or at least as important. And it brings me to the topic of my talk. Uh, I hope. Right. So um, essentially around 1890, there was this paper written by uh, someone who then later became Judge Brandeis and a colleague of his in a law firm. Uh, and they uh, wrote, uh, this is a very famous paper, people have probably seen it, uh, at least something quoted from it, which is this phrase called uh, the right to be left alone. So in this paper, they use this phrase, the right to be left alone, say, and I think he was uh, right on the hill, hills of this idea that cameras were not, you didn't have to go to a camera shop to be photographed, but people could carry cameras and take pictures of you in the street. It's like, how could this happen? You know, how about my right to be left alone? Now, it's laughable, really, if we think about what we do today, right? You know, everything about me, every time I go to a service, 
um, you know, people are collecting information about me. And still, you know, it's a very interesting phrase. And most of, a lot of the work that we do in fields of cryptography is trying to say that we still are be, have some right to be left alone. Maybe our communications are private. Maybe our use of um, a, a, the cloud, a, we'd, we'd like to make it private and so forth. But I guess what I'm saying is that uh, what I, the topic of my talk today is going to be deniability. So I, and I'd like to uh, propose that that might be the ultimate extension of the right to be left alone. So the right to be left alone uh, in our world is very difficult. You know, so suppose I don't have the compute, I don't uh, the, do the things I want to do, so I go to the cloud. And then uh, there it is, you know, my data is out there. And even if it's encrypted, uh, it, there's some trace of it, okay? And the trace of the computations that I've done. So who, in what sense am I going to be left alone if somebody later wants to pursue and, show, and say, give me all your emails, give me all your computations? Um, so the, the, uh, we're saying that uh, today that we want to talk about tools which allow you to deny say, no, this is not what I said, this is not what I computed, even though you have some public record of what I've done, I, you have a way to formally deny the, what, uh, what you have done. And perhaps this expands in a good way on the idea of the right to be left alone. So I'm not exactly left alone, but since I can deny everything and have some record of, I can sort of prove that, that, um, that I deny properly, it would mean that can't take, I can't be taken to court or I can't be prosecuted because I've denied it and I have a legitimate de course of denying. This will come more clear as I go along. Um, so um, let me give you a motivation which is more concrete, okay? And where this whole idea of deniability came up uh, many years ago in cryptography. So many years ago, I think it was uh, Ron Rivest at MIT. He was teaching a course on cryptography and he was interested in uh, electronic voting. Uh, at the time, very naive, you know, like, why wouldn't it, why can't we just vote at home? If you're trying to encourage a lot of people to vote, put your vote, encrypt it, send it to the government. Um, and uh, then there was a student there, Josh Benelow, and he, he, he um, came up with this nice homomorphic encryption method, which was additive, which means you can encrypt, individuals encrypt their votes, and then uh, there's a way to uh, figure out from all these encrypted votes what the sum of the, encrypted sum of the votes is, and then you just decrypt that sum. And now you know if you voted more for, let's say if there are two parties, if it's closer to zero, closer to one, okay. Um, and uh, the understanding was that in order to have a good electronic uh, a voting system, you need the right for equal and effective access to a polling station. Check, you just send your encrypted vote online. You need the right to vote in secret, you vote at home, and you encrypt your vote, so that's secret. You need the right for a vote uh, to be a awarded equivalent weight. Yes, because this way of tallying was such that they didn't give one vote five votes, but every single vote counted once. But there is a, um, one more thing in voting. So this is just a schematic. So let's say vote for zero, vote for one. There's a the government. Let's say they, they publish on the election day some public key, which, and they keep secret some secret key. And then uh, all these individuals, they compute a ciphertext, CT, which is the encryption of their individual votes, encrypt of zero, encrypt of one, vote for zero, vote for one. And then there is uh, a way using this homomorphic encryption thing to compute a new ciphertext, CT star, which is essentially using just these individual votes, encrypted votes, and then tallies them. Magically, it comes up with this uh, ciphertext so that when you decrypt that special ciphertext, you get the sum of the votes and not individual votes. So of course you could ask is, wait a second, uh, if the government has the secret key, who is to say that they're not going to also encrypt individual votes and only going to decrypt, decrypt individual votes, but only decrypt a tally? And the answer to that is usually that there isn't really a safe with a secret key in it that the government can open, but this safe is a split secret key, so secret shared, and shares of the secret key are in different safes, and only if all these safes come together, you can decrypt and they will all, and not everybody who holds the shares is bad, and therefore, if not everybody's bad, then you one of the shares won't come together when you're trying to decrypt individual votes, and you're only going to decrypt a tally. Okay, so this is wonderful. It looks like the problem is solved. Looks, uh, the one problem is that one more requirement for voting is that you shouldn't be able to v I'll, I'll buy somebody's vote. Okay, 
So when we go into the polling station, we close the screen behind us. Uh, we are assuming there are no cameras there to see who I voted for. And uh, however, what about when you vote online like this? Uh, so what, people can not see what you voted for, but they can see the encryption of what you voted for. Okay. So does that make it more possible to buy votes? Okay. And the observation was already at the time was that yes, unfortunately, you can buy votes as follows. This person says, hey, Bob, who'd you vote for? And proof that you voted for me. And if you prove it, I uh, will going to give you money, say. So how do I prove for an electrical uh, vote, sorry, for electric voting, electronic voting, then it gets money, that I voted for Bob. I show him exactly what I did. I said, listen, I encrypted a vote for you. Now encryption is usually randomized, so I give the randomness. I give the randomness, I give the vote, and they can redo my operation and see that that's really what I sent the government. And then Bob is happy, gives you money. He bought your vote or gives you love. By the way, um, these slides, I have three different results I'm going to talk about, and mm -hmm. they're all slides that I've changed by my co-authors. So there will be three different styles, and I will give reference <laughs> credits when the time comes. But in any case, um, you understand the problem? So if I voted electronically and everybody can see this encrypted vote, now they can come to me and say, hey, who'd you vote for? And I can sh prove to them who I voted for. Uh, and therefore, this is an incentive to vote for one versus the other, which is not supposed to exist. The reason going behind a curtain is a good idea is because then I can really uh, vote for one person, claim I voted for another person, it doesn't really change, shouldn't change my vote. Of course, if the whole country um, votes for one person and I vote, I claim I voted for another one, that's one way to check, but you understand the point. Okay, so this was a problem in the solution that Benelow gave. And in 97, there was this beautiful, beautiful paper by Ron Canetti, uh, Monina Orr, Cynthia Dwork, Rafael Ostrovsky. They had this notion, okay? They said, you know what? We're going to come up with a new kind of encryption scheme, which is called deniable encryption scheme. And the idea of a deniable encryption scheme is that you could vote, let's say, for somebody. This is a real vote, okay? And, and when you send the ciphertext to the government, you know, to tally. But when this guy comes around and say, hey, Bob, prove that you voted for me. In this encryption scheme, you could actually prove to him you voted yes or you voted no. So you can both prove that you actually sent, encrypted this vote, but you can also prove that you encrypted the complement vote. Now, what does it mean prove? To prove, you have to show who you voted for and show the randomness so that when you encrypted using that randomness and that vote, that's the cipher deck that was set. So somehow they showed a way that there is a faking routine that produces an, a, an alternative randomness that with this randomness and the complement vote, the same cipher text would have been sent. Okay, so the cipher text is when you encrypt under the, the true vote in R is going to be exactly the same as the complement vote in R prime. It seems very bizarre, okay? So what's inherent about this idea is that there is a small probability of error when you decrypt. So uh, it, there is some small, negligibly, exponentially small probability the government will, instead of understanding your vote correctly, will understand incorrectly. But you can make that probability extremely small, okay? So overall, the government will understand all the votes correctly and tally them correctly. But this small probability of error enables this mechanism so that for every vote that I send, I can actually produce randomness that uh, proves that I voted the complement vote. Bizarre. So I, in some sense, can prove that I voted for what was the last election in the US. I can prove that I voted for Trump, and I can pr prove that I voted for Biden, and it looks the same. What does it mean looks the same? Well, there's some thing, there's some randomness. It's, there's the fake randomness, and there's the real randomness. So this is the fake distribution. That's when I vote using fake randomness that was produced by the fake routine. And this is when I voted with using with the real randomness. And these randomness should be equally sort of look, it shouldn't be able to tell them apart. They should look the same. So whoever that, that agent was that was trying to buy my votes really can't tell whether I'm telling him the truth or I'm just claiming something that I didn't do. Really an ingenious idea. So clever, so beautiful. Somebody asked me what is exciting about cryptography. Well, Every once in a while, there's a new idea. That's an exciting idea. Okay, so they did this. They had this notion. They had a solution. They also uh, had some uh, minuses about their solution. So what is a minus? 
uh, one of them is that you really want this indistinguishable. You want this guy to believe both when you tell the truth and when you fake him out. So you, you shouldn't be able to distinguish these distributions at all. So this uh, distinguishing between real R and fake R prime, okay, should, the probability of distinguishing should be very low. Any questions? Because I know that people here don't work on this kind of stuff at all. And we, yes. What? Oh, you could do, yeah, you could do arbitrary, you could do larger message space. You could vote for 10 thing for, okay. yeah. And then also it will cost, so in that. And then in that case, the way you want to do, say that for every pair of values in the value set that you can vote for, you could switch from one to the other. Oh. Okay. Okay. So you have 10 candidates, you can switch from candidate uh, A to candidate L, you know, or whatever. So one to seven, three to five and so forth. Okay. Uh, yeah. Very small because uh, the individual prob individual encryptions have some probability of being decrypted incorrectly, but exponentially small. And the number of votes is polynomial. In our world, always there's polynomial versus exponential. So if there's exponentially small probability of making a mistake. Overall, you, you're really never going to make a mistake. So the lo the loss in vote, yeah. Get the bit of it. All of it. Get boop kill it. Exactly. That's exactly the idea is yes, you can uh, try to coerce me, but you, there's no point in it, so don't. I mean, you can try, in, but it's a futile exercise. Exactly, yes. I want to step motivation for the average. I completely agree. That's not, okay. So you have to, for at least an hour, suspend this worry and say what we want to do is deny. Now. You say, we deny, but all it, everybody else is talking about fake news. Now you can also deny that it's fake. So to answer that, you say, let's have another key, a trap door, that is in extreme circumstances, they can, for, they can overrule your denying. However, you know, it's this fight, it's this pendulum, right, between enforcing the law and not being pro prosecuted by, you know, an author authority. I agree with you. I'm talking about how to deny. If you like, we can just think about it as intellectually interesting. I think if you can get both and put some mechanisms on when you can deny and when you can not deny, it would be more interesting. Okay, great question. So it, uh, it, it seems paradoxical almost, but it's not. So the, the government has the secret key. And if you have the secret key, you can figure out that when you decrypt, you're going to get the right vote. It's just that when uh, that strange person with the hat comes to me, the sender, I can claim that I did one or the other. But the other side that has the secret key, they can tally the votes up correctly. Yes. The, a government? No. This is distinct, though. The distribution is the same, right? Yeah. So I voted for some, say it's a binary thing, I voted one. Now uh, the government has to decrypt it. Can it decrypt it to zero? Since there is a randomness which is... Okay, so you so so you could add the government having a, a zero knowledge uh, proof system or something where they prove that they have followed, that they have decrypted correctly. Namely, they use their secret key correctly without, and that will not divulge the votes, but will only divulge the outcome and but prove that they did not uh, do something uh, funny. Okay. But that, that, you solved that by another problem. I see. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. It's a scheme where they give you an efficient subroutine for faking. Otherwise, it's useless. Okay. So with all this, uh, what was the assumption? So you know, in cryptography, often it's not, it's not, it, you, don't come, it's not you don't get something for nothing. Uh, there's usually some computational assumption. But the assumption in this original paper was really beautiful, simple assumption that there's that this primitive called trapdoor functions exist. It's just that there are functions which are easy to compute, hard to invert, unless you know some trapdoor, okay? And we can base this on factoring, on hardness of lattice problems, on bilinear maps, on all kinds of hard computational problems in mathematics. And, um, and, uh, and they showed a construction. The minus was that in order to make this, um, this uh, 
a beautiful thing where they are and they are prime, really are indistinguishable from each other, like they look very close, the size of the ciphertext in their ciphertext in their solution grew uh, in the in the inverse of the, the difference probability. So if you wanted to be like one in uh, n, n is some sort of security parameter here, then um, the ciphertext would be linear. But if that's not a very big probability of detection, you could detect, you know, in linear time. But if you wanted to make it one in two to the n, okay, so they can't tell apart in exponential time whether you voted for r or r prime, then the size of the ciphertext would be two to the n too large. Okay, so there was a minus in the, in their solution. Uh, and in fact, there was some sort of big question, right, can you get deniability versus compactness? That was open problem. There was another, um, uh, I, I, I want to say something. There's a, you ask very good questions, but you didn't ask the obvious question. The obvious question is, if you want to do this, why do you need all this sophisticated mathematics? Why don't you just erase your randomness? So I vote, I erase, then somebody says, hey, show me that you voted for me. Uh, and I say, well, I erased it. Well, because I want money. I don't care about the election. So I would like to vote for you, and I'd like to convince you that I voted for you. So erasing doesn't answer that. And two, I mean, I don't know if I want money, but whoever it is, Bob there wants money. Um, but, and, and furthermore, maybe by regulation, you're not supposed to erase your randomness, you know? So erase, plus it's a very simple solution. And the whole beautiful fu intellectual fund doesn't come up here. So erasing is not part of not a legitimate solution. Okay, so long history followed. People got very fascinated in the way that cryptographers do, and they talked about uh, receiver deniability, and that is that the government, let's say somebody got a message from me, and they and I have the secret key, and then the government says, hey, show me all the messages you received. Give me the secret key. I might want to deny that. Can I come up with an alternative secret key that de doesn't de really decrypt the messages properly, but decrypts them in such a way that some messages are flipped? So people defined that, then they showed some lower bounds on that. They talked about by deniability. There's all kinds of lower bounds that are showed here about key sizes, ciphertext sizes, and so forth. Okay, lots of work. Significant step forward was in 2014. This result by uh, Amit Sahai and Brent Waters, where they showed this result that some of the cryptographers here know that there's something called uh, in IO obfuscation, some way of program obfuscation, where they showed that if you have such program obfuscation, then you could do deniability achieving both compactness and uh, deniability and everything else you want. Problem is that this IO obfuscation is a very heavy tool, heavy hammer. Uh, at the time, it was just a conjectured thing. They had some sort of a blueprint of how to get it. These days, there are already concrete assumptions that if you could put all of them together and you believe them, you could build such IO. But in terms of deniable encryption, the problem really is that if you look at the, uh, from 1997 to where in that breakthrough in cryptography, people love to do wonderful things, okay? And all, and in the beginning, we say we assume anything. Let's assume hard, factoring is hard and, and lattices are hard and, I don't know, and adding and uh, dividing is hard. That's a joke. But we are willing to throw, because it's not hard, we are willing to put as many assumptions as we like. But the truth is, at the end, the value of the result is related to the value of the assumption. So it's beautiful that we have ideas, but at the end, if the assumptions are false, then the security doesn't hold. So there is a very different, the big difference between the assumptions they made in 97 with that simple trapdoor function, which can be based on any kind of polynomial, any kind of hard problem in some sense that we have a cryptography versus what Sahai and Waters assume, where they assume that specific problems are hard and they're exponentially hard. So they're extremely hard, okay? So the open question that remained here is how can you get reasonable assumptions, compactness and deniability? And finally, as is always the case with researchers, because we kind of get fixated, this is the problem, is like we got, the, it, this deniable system is no longer homomorphic. So in terms of applying to encryption doesn't, in a, in a voting doesn't work. So you could have deniable encryption, but you can't add these uh, encryptions and then tally up the votes and then deny that you sold your vote. Okay, so um, <clears throat> remember to do the elections, we needed to have homomorphic. We needed to be able to tally up votes without decrypting individually. And we want a deniability so that votes cannot be bought. Okay, so what this brings me to what we're gonna do today. We, uh, there are gonna be three parts, although I think that with the questions probably gonna be two parts. Uh, and part one is uh, uh, joint work with Shweta Agarwal, who I think is a professor in Chennai, um, and, uh, and Sanit Mosso, a graduate student of mine that now works in Algorand. Uh, and, uh, and what we show is an, uh, a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, so not just some homomorphism, but fully homomorphic encryption scheme, which is 
more uh, applications than just elections, which I'll mention in a minute, which is also deniable. And um, we do this in a way where the ciphertexts are compact. It has some other issues, but it, and the assumption is um, sort of a reasonable assumption is learning with errors is hard. For, we know right now it's hard also for quantum computation. This is a mouthful, I'll repeat it. That will be part one. Part two is more recent work with Umesh Chabazirani and Andrea D'Angelo at, at Berkeley. You know, um, hey, it's the paper here. No, I think, oh, sorry. I think I'll, when I go to part two, I'll post the paper, I'll write the reference to the paper. And what we do is we say, you know what, suppose quantum computers are gonna be a reality. Is there something that quantum uh, computi computing pow quantum power allows to do in the realm of deniability that classically is impossible? So there are certain things which are classically impossible, like having a zero decryption error. And um, it turns out, or like coercing after the fact, so in this whole story, the coercer comes afterwards and say, hey, prove your vote, and I give him the vote and the randomness. But if he told me before, five days before, this is the randomness you should use, and then he just checks that I use the right randomness, then he can coerce me before the fact, right? And in fact, classically, you can prove that you can't, you can't avoid that. Before the fact, you can always coerce people. If you tie their hands, you tell them exactly what to do, in some sense, you look over their shoulder, shoulder that they did exactly this, there's nothing to do. It turns out that if you could let quantum use quantum power, it's a fairly limited sense. You are able to come up with a secure, le with, with a, a way to vote, okay, which is deniable in a much stronger sense. Like you could not coerce even before the fact. You have a zero uh, uh, decryption error. So there's some things about quantum computation, some about the magic of quantum enables you to do things we cannot do classically. And somebody asked me today, uh, I think we had a fire chat, and they asked me, or maybe it wasn't with a student's meeting, I already forget. But somebody asked me, what are we gonna do when quantum is there? It's gonna, all this cryptography that you've developed is worth nothing. And I believe it's quite the opposite, that we can replace the, the, the cryptography we've already developed by, let us say, lattice-based cryptography, which we don't know how to break on quantum. And if lattice will break, we'll find something else. But there is some ability that quantum computers give you that they break some things we can't do classically that in the event, which I don't know if it's gonna happen or not, that there will be quantum computers available, we probably can do things we cannot do today. And they will be not in the direction of breaking, but they will be in the direction of giving some extra power that we didn't think was possible. Okay, the last thing will be about receiver deniable, if we get to it. Okay, all right, so let's start with this first result, like deniable encryption in this story that I told you. So the sender wants to deny that he sent one message versus the other. But I want to have it also homomorphic encryption. So you must have seen uh, several uh, talks here about fully homomorphic encryption, uh, but I will say what the essence is. So the essence, so fully homomorphic encryption is something that came up in 2008 by a paper of Greg Gentry. And then the, I think the, the scheme that most people use these days is one of these two. This is by Zwickler, Barkersky, Craig Gentry, and Vinod Vikland Nathan from 2012. And this is, I think, Garge, Sahai, and Waters. 2013, these are encryption schemes which are phenomenal in the following sense. They can do this. You know, you can sort of encrypt as a client data, send it to uh, this encrypted data, even to a cloud. The cloud, you give it some ability to evaluate, it's called an evaluation key. The cloud now can run arbitrary programs, okay? Or usually we think of them as Boolean circuits on these encrypted data without decrypting it. So the cloud doesn't know how to decrypt. Later, they return to you the, re the output of the computation, the result of running all these programs in an encrypted fashion. So they never decrypted. They just did this engine of programming. But you, the client, know how to decrypt. You can decrypt the result of the computation. So in a sense, it's moving all the computational, even if all the computational power is in the cloud, you can be safe and just send your data encrypt to the cloud. It does the computation, and then it gives you back the result, which you can decrypt. OK, beautiful. Now it's expressive, so it could, you could uh, support arbitrary circuits. You know, there is, it's compact. Okay, so you send an encryption uh, of uh, the inputs, and you get encryption of the outputs. You don't have to keep any intermediary result; only the cloud has to keep it. It's based on learning with errors, uh, which is a problem that I think is easier to uh, comprehend than the lattice problems. But it's equivalent to it. So the, the hard problem here is not factoring integers. But just think that you have a system of equations, modular equations, 
the, the unknowns are these S's, which you can think as, as numbers in uh, between 1 and 17, or minus 17 and 17, okay? And this is a secret. And uh, you don't have the real equations, because if you had the equations, you could do linear algebra and find what these S's are. You have sort of dirty equations. So these equations are really not correct. There's, they're, they're off by some error, okay? But you're given a system of equations, and the hard problem is to find the S's. This is called learning with errors. It's a hard problem, even we don't know how to solve it by quantum computers. And this is the current hard problem that the modern cryptographic systems that are being proposed, including fully homomorphic encryption, are based on. If this is a hard problem to find S, then we can find public key cryptography, digital signatures, fully homomorphic encryption, and so forth. You look like you want to ask a question. No, okay, fine. Um, okay, so this is what homomorphic encryption allows you to do. And it's composed usually of a way to generate keys, a way to encrypt and decrypt, a way to encrypt, a way to decrypt, and a way to evaluate in the cloud. So there's a routine so that the cloud, it gets this evaluation key, get, yes, and then it can evaluate. Yes. It, the four? Where is there four? Ah, no, no. This is just an arbitrary. It's a, the four important, the 17 is not important. The four is because there's S1, S2, S3, S4. What if I have to be in the... Uh, they, for the hardness, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's fine. It's even two is fine. Um, okay, so what's important actually is the uh, seventeen is the size of the field and uh, the error, and you can have also many equations. For this book force, when we talk about solutions, which uh, we talk about polynomial time, you can. So there is a brute force solution because you've just, even if you, this problem seems to be difficult, even if the error is just plus one minus one. So you each each one of them is either off by one or minus one. So you would have to try all possibilities, you know, for, um, so here it matters uh, you, the number of equations, the number of S's also, because you you would have to try all possibilities. That would be an exponential uh, effort and that's considered too much effort. So it's all asymptotics, right? The four is something that can grow. The 17 is something that can grow. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, the 40. Why do they hit quit? We just need additive, right? Oh, they know that's a 50. Is that? No, 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 that's the key. If the government knows the secret key, then we're in trouble because then they could uh, decrypt my vote and know what I voted for, you vote. No, this we, it denies the privacy. So I think I said in the beginning there was the safe and the secret key was in there. It's We don't want to give the government the access to the safe. We want to split the secret key into shares, Let's say there's the government, there's the lo uh, law, there's uh, Congress, I don't know, whoever, the distribution of power, and they ca have to come together and they only come together to, dis to decrypt the outcome. Uh, good question. I said it, but too quick and too early. Okay. All right. So why, um, okay, maybe it's the next, yeah, I, before the theorem, I want to say why do we need fully homomorphic encryption? Because Forget the election. I'm thinking cloud computing. I want to put all my data in the cloud, encrypt it. I want the cloud to do the computations for me, and then I want to get the results. And I don't want to worry about the fact that tomorrow somebody's going to tell me, I want you to show me everything you encrypted, what it was, all the computations you had done. How am I going to do that? I want to be able to deny it. And if it's fully homomorphic, it means that for every computation I'm going to do, I can deny it. Now, you know, there are some subclasses of, of fully homomorphic where there are some things you can do and some things you cannot do. Maybe that's one answer to the question of what, should you be able to deny everything and say, no, you should only be able to deny some of the computations and not others. So if you can deny fully homomorphic encryption, you can also deny this cloud computing engine. Okay. Um, so back, so what does the theorem say? The theorem says we can construct a deniable fully homomorphic encryption scheme. The security will be based on the hardness of layering with errors, which is the problem that I showed you. The, the ciphertext will be compact, so the size now is going to be independent of the probability you can distinguish between R and R prime. Remember I said that the solutions were not compact. Uh, and we're going to distinguish between online and offline encryption time. There's be an offline will be short, okay? But unfortunately, this is not the ultimate result. When we go to quantum, we will get, in some sense, the ultimate result. Uh, it's still going to be the case that uh, during encryption time, Encryption time will be long if I want to get, uh, it will be in the, essentially one over the probability of distinguish between R and R prime. So encryption time, the online encryption time will grow with how far apart R and R prime are. 
So if they're one n apart, one over n apart, the encryption time will be linear. If they're one over two to the n, the encryption time will be exponential. So we haven't completely, we have gotten over compactness. We have this online, offline, good beneficial idea, but we haven't completely solved the problem. However, we did get homomorphic encryption and we did get a much lower uh, assumption. No. So in the original paper on deniable, they had a lower bound, but it's not right. I mean, in the sense, you know, lower bounds often you define it so you can prove a lower bound. And uh, obviously they, they proved that compactness is, is impossible, but it's not impossible because we can do it. Uh, okay. So um, we did this. Uh, how do we do it? Now I know that most of you are not cryptographers, but I don't know how to give a whole talk without some technical stuff. So I'll do something, okay? It's, ab it's about five minutes. Uh, and I'll try to say it in a way that's accessible to most people. So usually when you put your mind to do a deniable system, all you care about is deniable, but we're not gonna do it that way. We're gonna take an existing homomorphic encryption scheme, we change a few of the uh, properties and add deniability to it. In fact, the way we're gonna do it do you hear me or something happened? No, you hear me. The way we're going to do it is use some of the properties, uh, which are, is it lower voice? Something happened. Hello? I think it's better. Yeah. Um, so somehow we're going to take two schemes. We're going to take a, a homomorphic encryption scheme and we're going to take a deniable encryption scheme, which just means that there's a fake subroutine and we're combining them together. So the new system will also will able to evaluate in the cloud and fake. So that is produce alternative randomness. Uh, wonderful. So just a little bit to remember syntax. Evaluation means that there's sort of a public key which enables you to encrypt a whole bunch of ciphertext and some function and it produces a new ciphertext C star CT star so that when you decrypt it, you get the function F applied to the plain text. So you homomorphic, you, you somehow c come up with the ciphertext when you decrypt it as a result of running F on the plain text. Okay. And fake means that you can switch between B to B prime. For the sake of this talk, it will be between zero and one, but this result really can go from message to message prime where there are arbitrary strings in some set of values. Okay. So, um, I think the main, actually, the most interesting thing about this, uh, I think fully homomorphic encryption is really, the way it's done is a genial idea, okay? And if people have heard it and don't remember or never heard about it, get this out of this talk, you really got something, okay? It's a beautiful idea. And what I'll show you is that idea, in addition, can carry deniability with it, okay? So essentially, we need a special homomorphic encryption scheme. There's a whole bunch of properties here. Really, let's just focus on a few of them. One of them is that when you look at the ciphertext, okay, whether it's encrypting Shafi, encrypting uh, Biden, encrypting Trump, <laughs> we're all running for president, um, you, it looks like it's a random, the ciphertext looks like a, you can't distinguish random from pseudorandom, so they look pseudorandom, okay. And that's something you can get. Second of all, what we need for our thing to work is that there's at least this following homomorphic operation, and that is that if I'm given uh, a, a, an encryption of A, say, an encryption of B, I'm able, this is just notation, to come up with a, encryption, a new ciphertext, CT star, which I'm going to donate, like, it's encryption of A with this strange operation, let's think of it as an XOR, uh, in, encryption of B, such that when you decrypt this new ciphertext, it's notation for a new ciphertext, you will get essentially the sum mod to of what was encrypted of A and B. Okay, so there is a way to take two ciphertexts, one encrypting A and one encrypting B, and come up with a new ciphertext that, create, that encrypts A plus B mod two. Okay, that's all I need to retain from this idea of homomorphic encryption. I'm able to come up with ciphertexts that when you decrypt them, it's the sum mod two of the, of the respective plain text. Okay, and there's two more properties, and that is that, uh, magically, but it's very easy to take existing homomorphic encryption and get this extra property. If I just put a random number in the space of where the cy ciphertext live, not really by encrypting, just picking a random uh, uh, something in, in the range, okay, uh, or the code domain, 
Then, and I run a decryption routine on it, it decrypts to zero. So if you think about this, really, you have the whole work, you have the space of what, where ciphertext lie. There's sort of the legal zeros, which were obtained by encrypting a zero. There's the legal ones, which were encrypt, obtained by encrypting a one. And then there's all the stuff that never would have come up by legally encrypting. But still, if I took something from, wasn't legal encryption of zero or legal encryption of one, and I tried to decrypt it, a random element in this whole space, it, you, it will decrypt to zero with very high probability. Weird property will be useful. And then uh, I need something which is called bootstrapping, um, which I will not get into right now. Okay? Yeah. Small. Might, might be exponentially small. Okay? So there's a very large space, but uh, really uh, the number of legal encryption, I mean, it's a large space, but within that, it's, it's exponentially small. Okay. Okay. A, all right. So we have a schemes that satisfy almost all this property. And now comes the bootstrapping magic. So this is the thing that I think is magical about homomorphic encryption. So the idea of homomorphic encryption that Gentry already had uh, was this. Here's what he, the idea was. And I remember I was in a, an Oberwolfock conference and I had breakfast and he said he could do this, he could do this. And I said, really, how do you do it? And I didn't expect to understand anything. And he told me the idea over like 10 minutes of breakfast, okay, in a way that I could understand it. Because I think any time that you have a really big idea, you can explain it over breakfast in 10 minutes. Okay, um, so the idea there was this. How do you get homomorphic evaluation? How can you evaluate arbitrary programs on encrypted so that at the end you get the value, you get a ciphertext that decrypts the program running on the plaintext? So the idea was that, first of all, um, every ciphertext um, in, in his encryption, it was sort of noisy. So every ciphertext, when you decrypted it, there was some probability of error. But fresh ciphertext, there's so a notion of fresh ciphertext when you just encrypt it, where the error was really small. And then every time that you compute, now you take two encryptions and you do some magic to get a new ciphertext whose corresponds to the adding those two or multiplying the plain text. So every time you do an operation, you sort of add noise because the noise that was in the original two so adds, either adds or multiplies, very quickly you get garbage. It's not true anymore that if you decrypt, you get the program evaluated on the original plaintext. He says, how do you get rid of this noise? So he said, you know what? The way that I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a routine called bootstrapping, which takes in a noisy ciphertext and reduces it, and replaces it by a new uh, fresh ciphertext CTA star. Both of them decrypt A, but this guy has a lot less noise. And in a minute, we'll see how he does it. But he says, in that case, I can do operations, get too much noise, I bootstrap. I go back and have less noise. I do more operations, I bootstrap. But how, how do you get rid of noise? I mean, one way to get rid of noise is that you decrypt, you find what A is, and you re-encrypt, you know, with a fresh ciphertext that has little noise. That you can't do, all right? The cloud is not supposed to be able to decrypt and get rid of noise, okay? And this is where... Uh, the genial ideas. He said, well, what we're going to do is somehow we we have this uh, ciphertext and I want to get rid of, and it's a noisy ciphertext, I want to get rid of noise. What I'm going to do, I can't decrypt, but may, but I can homomorphically val the decryption itself is an algorithm. Maybe I can run this decryption algorithm, think of it as an homomorphic evaluation of the decryption algorithm. But that's very strange. If the cloud, now the cloud can decrypt, he says, no, we're going to give the secret key encrypted and do a morphic evaluation of the ciphertext and the encryption of the secret key. So in some sense, I, I decrypt under the hood. So sort of I decrypt the message has a lot of noise, but I, un, under sort of the umbrella of encryption, I throw away the noise and re-encrypt. Okay, so there was in my bad uh, type, it was here. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a decryption algorithm, which takes an encryption and a secret key, but both in encrypted form and you run an evaluation on it. What does evaluation do? It decrypts this guy. The pink means it's encrypted. It decrypts it, and now it has A in its hand. But he doesn't really have A in its hand. He says A is still uh, an encrypted form. Now, though, you can sort of inject, uh, have an, a fresh encryption of A with fresh noise, and that has lowered the noise. He was much better at breakfast than I am now at lunch, but he didn't have jet lag. Maybe he did. It was in Germany. Uh, in any case, this is magic, okay? Um, magic because 
I just said that by doing a lot of uh, uh, procedure uh, computations, you inject more and more noise. So maybe also by doing this computation, you're injecting noise. So his magic was that he showed a scheme where the encryption was very uh, few operations. So the amount of noise that was introduced by doing the evaluation of decryption was so little that you can support it. This is, whoever's intrigued by it should read that paper, uh, but otherwise we continue. So why is this relevant to me? Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that exact same bootstrapping mechanism, which he had for reduced noise for getting deniability. Okay, but the way, but instead of, my issue is not noise. My issue is that going to enable me to somehow sample ciphertext, okay, without going through the encryption routine. Usually I'm supposed to take a zero and encrypt it, take a one, we're encrypted. Somehow, like what bootstrapping is going to do for me is that I'll be able to just choose something at random in the big space, which I said usually decrypts to zero, okay, and run bootstrapping on it, which will replace it by a fresh ciphertext of zero. And now this is a way to come up with things that look like legal ciphertext, okay, of zeros and one, right? Take something at random at zero and do a bootstrapping to it. And what does that mean have to do with deniability? Before I go into the nitty gritty of it, the key idea is this. I want to be able to tell you that I didn't encrypt a zero. I didn't, I encrypted a one or vice versa. If it's plausible that I didn't actually take randomness encrypted a zero, I just did chose a random, uh, just a random value. I claim I did, how do you know I didn't? It's indistinguishable from going through the zero and encrypting it, okay? So that's a legitimate story. If that's the legal way to encrypt, which is just to take a random element in the, in the, in the domain, in the code domain, okay? And then bootstrap, I don't know the randomness for it because I never took it, okay? So that's kind of the crux of the idea there is that there is a way to encrypt, which is really, you can't tell whether I went through the legal procedure or I just chose something at random to encrypt the zero. And that will lead to a fully deniable method. Um, so what time is it? Maybe I'll skip through the, how much more time do I have? 10 minutes or 15 minutes? 10 minutes, okay. So um, I'll just flash these, but essentially the way to encrypt then is if I want to encrypt a bit B, I choose a whole bunch of X's which are zeros and one so that the exclusive or of them is B, okay, B mod two. Any straight, any bit I can break into a bunch of random bits such that XOR is a bit, right? So a bunch of zeros and ones that if XOR to a zero, that's how I break B, being equal to zero or that exclusive or to one be equal to one, okay? And then the way I encrypt the XI is the zeros is I sample just at random as I said. But the way that I encrypt ones is that I actually choose from randomness and I go through the illegal encryption of a one with that randomness. And now the ciphertext that I send, and here's where compactness comes. So actually compactness also comes from the fact that fully homomorphic encryption is compact. Compactness is just the XOR of the bootstrap of all the ciphertext. In this case, this is the ciphertext, just random value. And in this case, this is the result ciphertext, the encryption of a one. So when I do this operation, right, by the compactness of fully homomorphic encryption, I get a small outcome. Okay, but, if you decrypt this, what does it decrypt to? It decrypts to whatever was meant by the encryption of our one, which is, let's say, maybe if it was a zero, or if it was a one, so it's the XOR of the values of the XI, which is the encryption of the bit. Okay, this is just, like, seems overwork. Instead of just encrypting the bit directly, I, take a, I break it down to a bunch of bits, I encrypt each one individually, one just by choosing at random, one by going, okay, for zeros. And Now, why, does it, why do I do that? By the way, so what's the randomness that I have to present to the guy with the hat when he comes and says, show me the randomness? Is that these that were randomly chosen, these XIs, and this was randomly chosen, and the little r were randomly chosen. So this is the ray, all the randomness I have to produce. How do I fake him out? How do I fake, fake him out? So the idea of faking out is, I, here's a fake. So let's say again, I, I, I voted just for a bit in this, for the sake of this talk, and I want to claim that I voted for the complement bit. And this is the randomness I really used, okay? And now I want to produce new randomness, which will look just as good as this original randomness. He won't be able to tell them apart. How do I do that? Well, of course, if I don't want to fake him out, I don't have to do anything. But what if I do want to fake him out? So first of all, if I switch from, let's say, zero to one or one to zero, all that means is that there is one of those bits of the X's which has to switch, right? 
So I, uh, in fact, I am going to look for uh, one of the bits that is one. So remember the XIs were such that if you, like the zero, one, one, zero, one, which I sort them together, I got the, when I sum what to them, I got the B. So I choose one. A one value, which was a one, and I, in my mind, as a mental experiment, I flip it into a zero. Okay, so now if I explore those things, I get exactly a complement vote, right? And now I need to produce randomness. All the randomness is unchanged except the randomness that was associated with this location. It used to be an encryption of one, okay? Um, and which meant that there was a little r, and I, I really encrypted the one properly when I sent it to the government. But what I'm just going to pretend that actually that's not what I did, that actually this was just an, uh, something I chose, it was an encryption of zero, so I just chose it in the random uh, codomain of ciphertext. Um, and that's it. Notice that the, uh, the ciphertext remains unchanged. Why is it? Because remember the ciphertext that we use, we took this bootstrapping of all these big R's. So if it was just random, I did bootstrapping of the big random guy that took from the ciphertext size. And if it was encryption of a one, I also took the big R. So I'm still doing the same operations exactly on the same big R's. It's just that in my mind, I'm saying one time the R was just chosen at random, one time was really the encryption of a one. So the ciphertext remains the same. And the key is now that the randomness, all that's changed is one XI switched from zero, from one to zero, okay? And one a big R I claimed was a big R rather, and I gave that rather than the little randomness. Anyway, the point is that this works. <laughs> Um, and, um, it's compact and I want to go forward unless there's a question. This is very technical and probably is best for people who read the paper and maybe they forgot and now any question. Okay. So let's go forward online, offline. The new landscape is that this is where we're at. Uh, uh, 2017 is actually right now. This is the scheme. Uh, and, um, uh, I want to just say something about quantum, okay? So what does quantum have to do with anything? So these days, people are working in quantum computing. They're discovering there's a lot of things you can do with quantum computers, uh, which we could have done before, but now you can do it for quantum circuit. So in other words, holomorphic encryption, we know how to do it for classically. There's results of uh, Ormila Madeev, who's now in Caltech. She was a graduate student of, uh, at Berkeley, of Umesh Mazrani. She showed how you could do holomorphic encryption for quantum circuits or verifying computation classically. Now they know how to verify quantum computation with a classical verifier. But there are some results which show that you can do use quantum computers to do more than you can do classically. And this is going to be one of them. So we'll show how to do deniable quantum encryption, where you get negligible deniability, compact, a zero decryption error, and prevent coercion before the fact, something that classically provably you cannot do. What's the idea? We still have the government. But now, in this futuristic world, and again, you know, I really, um, I always get somebody in the audience, so I warn you not to ask you, uh, ask me. Uh, they say, but hi, everybody's going to have a quantum computer. You know, I don't know. Uh, maybe they won't. The idea is the principle, okay? So it's a beautiful idea, and um, I can show that it's related to other things. So in this futuristic, unbelievable, you know, what was it, the movie that we were always seeing, 2001, with the... Space Odyssey, right? Okay. Uh, it doesn't seem that futuristic at all. You're talking to the computer, it's destroying the world, you know. Uh, this is kind of a current problem uh, or problem to come. Everybody has a quantum computer, okay? They have a quantum laptop. What does this laptop do? It does something, okay? When he wants to vote, it comes, comes up with a classical encryption of a vote and sends to the government. And the government still tallies the votes, okay? But... What does this help me with? Now he comes along and says, show me that you voted for me. And I am going to, there's, and, and the advantage of going quantum is the following, is that there's these beautiful results by Ulmesh and Bidik and a whole bunch of other people, which show that you can produce randomness internally in a quantum, using quantum entanglement and measurements, okay? So randomness is no longer gonna be provided by the sender. It's actually produced by the machines and I have no control over it. So there, in some sense, I can't, it makes no sense that I will show you the randomness because I don't even know what the randomness is. It's produced by the machine, one. Two, um, uh, so what's the deniability analog, okay? What does it mean then that if somebody comes and says to me, prove to me that you voted for me? 
what is the analog in a quantum? Uh, the analog is it maybe you give him uh, access to all your quantum states and let him look at it. Now, it's well known that if you did never measured any of these quantum states, he can reverse and find out what you voted for. But it's also true that if he sent out a ciphertext, okay, he must have been corresponding to a single bit. He must have measured a single bit at least. Otherwise, he couldn't get a classical output. So we're saying if you only allow this guy here to do one single bit of measurement, and then when the hat person comes and examines your computer, we prove that by looking at the states, the, set, the quantum states, you cannot this tell apart whether they encrypted a zero or encrypted a one. There's a exponentially small probability of distinguishing. If you look at the quantum states, okay? So, uh, thanks. Okay, okay. So this is what I mean. One, the randomness is produced internally. Two, you let the coercer examine your quantum states and then you prove that he, that he cannot tell from the contents of your computer whether you encrypted a zero or one. So again, it's deniable in the sense that there's no point in coercing because he cannot tell them apart. The magic here is um, that really the, um, the, the magic is that you can prove that you, he cannot even coerce you before the fact. So even if he tells you what to do, he cannot force you to do one thing or another because you don't have results yourself. It's what's cap the randomness, every, the internal measurements, entanglement, and, uh, and, and computation that you are doing are going to be such that you don't have full control over them and therefore you can, he cannot tell you what to do, okay? And yet uh, you will encrypt either a zero or one as you intended, it will decrypt it properly on the other side uh, and you can deny it. So um, just a quick, this is the result under LWE quantum polynomial hardness, you can get compactness. Perfect decryption, negligible detection probability, deniable encryption scheme. Ah, and I don't know, those of you who have done some quantum computation, uh, so that again, this a subset, you know, there is this beautiful idea by Ormila, where she said that there's this thing called claw-free trapdoor functions, where these functions where there is a Y here, and there are two inverses. And claw-free means that it's hard computation to get more than one inverse, for, uh, but there, is a, there are two inverses. And this is something we use in cryptography from the 80s for digital signatures. But what Ormil noticed is that you can build something like this based on this learning with errors in quantum world, okay? And she noticed that this enables you to, come, to do magical things, okay? And the one magical thing is, the main one, is that you can encrypt in, in, some, in a way, kind of this is her idea, is that in a quantum world, you... In a real, in a classical world, I was going to say real world. In a classical world, you take an x, compute f4. This is a one-way function, and now you have one inverse, but you don't know how to get the other inverse. In a quantum world, there is an ability to sample y such that you are holding the both inverses in a superposition. But either, but you can't figure out e neither x zero or x one because as soon as you are trying to figure out you measure it to try to find it collapses and you only find one. And moreover, what she really showed, which was interesting, was that you can come up with Y and some sort of random bit which whose result is this. Um, a D, which you can figure out, times the XOR of X0 of the inver of X0 and X1. This doesn't mean that you know either X0 or X1. You know the XOR of them. And this is a pseudo-random bit. And that enabled her then to talk about a new type of encryption which is essentially using this as a one-time pad to encrypt your, your message bit. It's this magic that also is going to lead to deniability because what we can prove is essentially this method is also uh, deniable. Again, you have to talk about looking at the contents of your registers and show that you cannot tell apart whether the outcome of this bit is a zero or, or one. Um, yet on the other side, the decryptor he know, has a trapdoor, so he knows, so this function has a trapdoor. So he's able to compute both x0 and x1. So when he gets this encryption, uh, he gets a z, and m xor with b, he can figure out what b is, because he can figure out both pre-images, x0 and x1, figure this out, this was given to him, and he can... All right. Uh, I think that's it. You can coerce before the fact. I won't get into it, because um, I know I'm out of time and out of patience. Uh, there was a third part, I will not talk about it, but I just want to go fast forward ahead, say my conclusion. Uh, sorry, 
How do you point at the end? Uh, <laughs> if I'm almost there. There I am. That's, no, one before. So the conclusion is deniability, in my opinion, may be the ultimate extension to the right to be left alone. People here right in the beginning raise the question is, is it reasonable to be able to deny everything? You know, I can deny everything now. I went into the booth and I could deny it. I'm doing some com computation on my computer and I unplug it from the internet. I deny it, you know. Why is it that with the use of technology, I should all of a sudden, it's not okay to deny? It's unclear, that's one response. And the other response is that maybe you are able to deny and also have a special mode where you cannot deny because the secret key is being held by someone and then they can really decrypt what you uh, intended to do. Thank you. And I just want to say one thing that I think that I didn't say, uh, and that is about the quantum. That uh, what's interesting about it is that we are looking more and more now for some evidence that quantum computers can do more than classical computers, or that uh, you know qu quantum supremacy. And you all know about the Google experiment, and now there's a bunch of results showing that they can do it classically as well. And an another thing you could ask is, what can can you really prove that your computer did more than classical? In some sense, it, it, you know this result is hinting in the direction is yet yeah, because you can do this core you can show that you cannot coerce be, uh, before the fact classically, but you can do, sorry, the other way. You can coerce before the fact classically, but you can't do it quantumly. So any su type of result that indicates that there is superiority, at least in principle, to a quantum computer, provably so. Because with factoring, probably you can factor classically as well. I mean, right now we have a quantum algorithm for factoring. But to have, in principle, a, a, a proof that something is possible quantumly and it cannot be done classically is very interesting, both as a motivation to show that quantum exists and maybe as evidence that it doesn't exist. I mean, we don't know the rules of quantum mechanics at all. We kind of assume they do. Yeah. If this was that follow they Yeah. The P is excitable. It's it. The random read that the landing that was such that this is the correct way to That's a that's a great question and it really uh it it it, it touches us another topic. So there was a census uh in the United States about two years ago would use methods called differential privacy. Differential privacy methods are where you don't actually, in some sense, don't answer correctly, you know, the, ans the questions of the census, but you put some noise in your answers. And then they tally up these uh, answers, and then the, on the aggregate, you're saying you get a good outcome. And now there are court cases where certain districts that were going to get less resources because of the results of the census, they say, but there was some probability, because you insert noise, that the results of the census are incorrect. And I have my constitutional right has been violated, uh, so this is the same, same question. It's like saying uh, an opposite party says that the election has been stolen because there was a probability of error. Good point. Uh, in some sense, it leads to this other question. It is, if we're going into a world where everything is going to be based on digital stuff and maybe big data and so forth, and eventually we're going to get court cases where people are going to say malpractice or some other, and they say because this was a statistical model and there's some probability of error and you caused this harm to me. Uh, so I think courts are going to have to have an understanding of statistics and an acceptance of statistics in order to be able to rule on these type of things, similarly in the election case. Or be able to get the bottom to preserve all that. But see that with a sub vice, but that if you see that the separation is not, you know that Yante is coming with it. Point. The separation for the devil come. That's true, but that uh, 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 but that is in uh, acts against uh, deniability because if the separation is large, then maybe also the guy with the hat 
can tell apart whether you encrypted uh, using the ran with the randomness you give is R versus R prime. That's the tension there. But the fact that there's a tension, hopefully maybe there isn't a solution. But right now I don't know. I'm not gonna Any other questions? Hi, yeah. The cursor, yeah. Ask him to use my key. And yes. then after you give the board proof to me that, uh, you know, indeed, yeah, this so I so this is coercion, coercion prior, right? Before the fact. Uh, so he forces you to use the randomness, you're saying? or to use right, right, right. Yes, it's possible classically, and you can prove that it, it has to be possible, but quantumly it's not possible. So that's the big thing about the quantum, is you can prove that he can, even if he coerces you before the fact, there's nothing you can still deny. So there's no way to, in some sense, prove that you did one thing versus the other. So... It doesn't matter what he says, you cannot prove, um, what you essentially show is that you cannot both produce a ciphertext and maintain enough state so that uh, you could uh, verify. Yep. So, uh, my question is more from the computing standpoint. So for some of these techniques to become commonplace for people to use, the cost of, for example, bootstrapping today is substantial and just the fully homomorphic encryption strategies are, you know, orders of magnitude slow. Are there algorithmically people have been looking at, I know that hardware people have been trying to reduce the cost, but are those algorithmically also looking at reducing the complexity or reducing some of the costs? That yeah, absolutely. I mean, people in this field are, are very aware of the fact that bootstrapping is expensive. So uh, it's ongoing work, both in academia and in industry, to uh, reduce the cost of bootstrapping. Part of it, it might be because you are going to uh, co um, a pack more uh, a plain text into ciphertext. You can do computing in parallel in a way that the boot, that the error doesn't uh, that the depth of the circuit doesn't, uh, it, it, it sort of remains shallow rather than increased, which means that you're going to need to do proof strapping less, com less often. Yeah. Yeah. People freaking achieve it. A using what? Only. Additive only. Um, yeah. I I don't see how to do it. I need bootstrapping in order to prove the results. But if you if, but if you think about it, bootstrapping was sort of secondary, was in order to have everything look uh, the same for the evaluation circuit. Uh, it was really the summing more too that was key kind of through the functionality of it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this notion of opacity where uh, both the secret and non-secret states produce the same output with some given inputs. So do you think there's a relation between the deniability and opacity? Because here also uh, two different states with two different randomness yeah. produce the same ciphertext. Okay, so opacity is again what? So in opacity, basically uh, you have a secret state yeah. and a non-secret state. Mm -hmm. And uh, you execute your program from these two initial states. Yeah. And you get the same output. Yeah. So if someone is looking at the output, it will not he or she will not be able to determine whether the starting point was a secret point or a non-secret point. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds very similar. Except in your case, you know uh, from the beginning, I guess, that you are um, what you that you want to deny. Is that correct? So you have secret state and non-secret state, and you so, have two types of computations. One is from the secret, from one of the non-secret, so that they end up in the same place. Correct. So basically, whereas here you are. Uh, if I claim, so the question is what the secret is in your mind. Is it the randomness or is it the vote? So I vote, starting from the vote and doing a compute, it's the same compute to get to the end. I, I'm guessing that in your case, you have two types of computing, one on the secret and one on the non-secret. But I'm not sure I understand your question. Maybe we can talk about it afterward. Oh, shit. Sure. Sounds related.
Great. Thank you very much.